Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, this is Lily Gorin with the New Books Network, the New Books and Political Science podcast. Today I'm joined by Efren Perez, who is the author of Diversity's Child, People of Color and the Politics of Identity. This was published in 2021 by the University of Chicago Press, and it is a deep dive into an understanding of what we mean by this term, person of color or people of color, um, and who falls into that category, and also how this becomes part of somebody's identity in the United States. But I am going to let Ephraim tell us all about that. Um, I'd like to welcome Efren to the show and ask him to tell us a little bit about himself and how he came to this particular project. Hello, Efren. Hello, Lily. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, yeah, so I'm Efren Perez, uh, professor of political science and psychology at UCLA, um, where I direct the Race, Ethnicity, Politics, and Society Lab, or the REPS Lab. Um, I'm originally from Los Angeles, uh, and you know, in some ways, um, how I came about uh, to work on this book is not unlike how other political scientists and social scientists um, ask questions. And that's, you know, you, you, there's a, it's a little bit of biography in some sense, right? You have certain experiences, certain intuitions, and none of that makes it right. But um, it definitely provides you a wellspring of, of possible hypotheses to test. And so for me, you know, growing up in L.A., um, you know, in the racial and ethnic landscape here, I was the prototype for most of my life, right? I'm second generation Mexican American. Uh, my first language and, and the language I prefer to speak is, is Spanish over English. Um, and then, you know, when I entered sort of the professional world and, and worked in state and local politics, um, some of that shifted a little. I began to be mentored mostly by people outside of my immediate ethnic group, primarily by um, African-American uh, either elected officials or their advisors. Um, and then when I went to graduate school, um, sort of that continued. You know, I was, I was really the only um, Latino, as far as I could tell, in, in, in the program, um, definitely in my cohort. Um, and much of the intellectual space and, and support that I received were essentially um, other non-white individuals who happened not to be part of my group. Now, the thing that was, I think, m- probably spurred me the most to do this was when I moved to my first tenure track position at Vanderbilt. And that's um, where I started to hear the term increasingly used, uh, you know, people of color, um, but usually to try to increase attendance for certain diversity and inclusion efforts uh, at the university. Um, But it became clear in very subtle and not so subtle ways that at least insofar as that immediate context was concerned, um, people of color really meant um, African-Americans, right? Not necessarily at the exclusion of people like me, but that exactly, that, that essentially people like myself were not the modal case, the best exemplar of that category. And so as a political psychologist, you know, this is, these are the sort of, when you cut nature at the joints, this is, this is sort of what you live for, right? You have a category that has some variation around the average or central tendency. And we know that insofar as a category is meaningful, under some circumstances, it gets catapulted into politics. And so I basically jumped into this project with um, a, a data collection that had um, large samples of African-American, Latino, and Asian-American adults. And it was really, in some ways, you know, a way to provide some proof of concept. Um, and it took. And so I thought I had maybe enough um, to, to contribute to this vast literature on, on racial and ethnic identities in the U.S. But when I first sent out the paper became back rejected. Maybe that's not surprising. What was surprising was that one of the reviewers basically said, there's too much in here. This needs to be a book. And so I wrote, I, I spent the rest of the time um, writing the book. And and this is a really fascinating book in part because you do tease out these multiple layers of our understanding of this big umbrella term that is used all the time. Um, And is also now I recently received something in an email where there was a sort of disclaimer um, with regard to the application of the term person or people of color. Um, 
that that it's you know it's still being negotiated as a, a category. So if you can explain for listeners um, before we get into sort of the the nuts and bolts of the research, what this category is, and you talk about its its kind of nebulous origin, um, and and how we look at it in the United States because it's in contrast to the white majority. Sure. Yeah. So I mean, there's really sort of three. Um, sort of signposts that are useful in, in, in making sense of the category. The first is that um, the terms in the category, people of color, um, you start seeing use of some combination of those terms um, by African Americans to refer to African Americans uh, roughly around the turn of the 1900s, right? Um, and you see it pro- perhaps most visibly in names of um, civil rights organizations like the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. So during the heyday of um, the civil rights movement, um, you know, many black leaders and opinion leaders in particular began to uh, use the term people of color as a way to expand um, the movement against racial and ethnic oppression. It was a way to find allies, right? And what's interesting is that that push was not just within the United States uh, in recognizing that there were parallel civil rights struggles being led by Mexican Americans in the Southwest, Puerto Ricans in the Northeast, Asian Americans uh, on the West Coast, um, but that there was an international component. And the, and the reason really, uh, according to um, opinion leaders, is that essentially racial oppression in the U.S. is tied to racial oppression um, in the third world and beyond, right? And so that was, that was the general narrative. That was the general push. And so this is when the, 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 the term itself starts to get a little bit of traction. And part of what is pushing it is this sense that um, people of color is a much more affirming um, label to describe in quotes minorities, right? Where minorities is a bit more devaluing. So this is very consistent with this push of um, um, not only to get more equal rights, but but recognition and acknowledgement that you know these various non-white peoples are a core segment of, of the U.S. population. Now, when you fast forward um, to the post-1965 era, this is the the era that marked a a watershed moment in immigration to the United States. Um, You start seeing in the late 80s and early 1990s again, primarily being led by uh, African-American opinion leaders, the use of people of color as a way to um, underline Um, just how extensive racial and ethnic inequalities are. And so you see this in newspaper coverage, for example, where um, an African-American reporter will refer to a local school board struggle where uh, African-Americans, Latinos, and other people of color are basically getting the short end of the stick. And so this is where the nature of, of people of color starts to come in, right? That it's essentially... Uh, uh, a minimizing of intergroup differences and a privileging of sort of like a shared experience, shared commonality, shared attributes, with one of the big ones essentially being that you appreciate that there are systemic causes to um, the inequalities that African Americans and others um, sort of experience. Now, when you start looking and poking around, um, what you realize is that the category itself is more than a turn of phrase. It's more than just um, a set of words. It basically indicates uh, a meaningful category that under some circumstances can do some political work um, for uh, individuals who are non-white. And in terms of doing this political work, um, in the United States, the way that it is applied, it generally encompasses, as you talk about in the book, three main non-white groups. Um, can you explain about how that umbrella term came to incorporate with regard to this inequality um, 
in the United States, those particular non-white groups. And so the, you know, it's a, it, it, in many ways, the, the, the story is about how categories that seem perhaps artificial on the surface take on meaning. Um, they, they grow some legs. And so I'll answer that by giving you sort of uh, two other examples where, you know, we take for granted, um, you know, uh, the, the, the life that certain categories have. One is Latinos in the U.S. or Hispanics. You know, this was a label that was primarily used by the U.S. Census to classify um, disparate and wildly different um, national origin groups, Mexican-Americans, Puerto Ricans, Cubans, ditto with Asian-American, right? And if you go back to the early 80s, um, you know, when there was like some hot debates about these terms, one of the main critiques was, look, these th- these groups are so artificial, right? They do they they're basically flattening experiences, and in some ways, in a normative sense, that is true. But in a cognitive sense, that's how categories operate. That's how identities take life. You have to have um, essentially some sense that there is a there there, right? And so, with people of color, a lot of the incorporation has to do with with rhetoric discourse that highlights not the differences between the groups so not the fact that african americans are here primarily because of slavery and its negative legacies and that maybe uh mexican americans are here primarily because of of immigration um but that you know if we sort of um look at the forest for the trees the common theme here is that we're all getting the short end of the stick to some degree because of some ascriptive, you know, attributes that we hold in common. And one of them is we're just not, we're not white. Now, this is, a, this is sort of an effort at persuasion, right? Not everyone within each of these racial or ethnic groups buys that, right? Um, but if you want, if, whenever you wonder why it has taken life, so part of it is, um, you know, down at the grassroots, there have been efforts to to make that argument with very little convincing counter arguments to be made. Right. And so this is, a, in, in essence, how you win it. You know, another critique is like, look, people of color is sort of a terminology that only people at the university level or that in con- you know consumer companies or something that that's stuff for them. And the reality is um There's a kernel of truth to that, but because of that constant repetition, we've become fluent in the use of people of color that we now acknowledge um, and that other people acknowledge, oh, when you're referencing that, it typically means to these groups and even within the groups that it refers to, um, you know, there is some clarity as to, okay, so who's the average, who's the best exemplar, and who's less so, right? Um, you know, I will say that in the book, you know, I started off with the with those three main groups primarily because they're the sort of the largest segments. Um, but in my lab, we've started to undertake some some work to assess essentially the degree to which other non-white communities that maybe are ignored um, uh, sort of operate with some of the tenets reported in the book. And so we have. Um, uh, one uh, research project that takes a look at the degree to which Middle Eastern and North African individuals um, uh, can also be persuaded um, to express solidarity with people of color, where people of color is essentially African Americans, Latinos, and Asian Americans. And the long and short of the answer is yes, it, you know, it appears to be sort of a mechanism that thrives essentially on um, highlighting um, shared experiences of discrimination, sometimes vicariously, right? They, they we're talking about groups where maybe some individuals don't directly experience these things, but they've had ancestors, some of them recent, who have. And so this is part of what makes the group one, right? You, we, can, we can point to, call out um, those kinds of experiences. And I wanted to ask you, because as I was reading through your research, and one of the things that you talk about early in the book is also that this is an understudied um, area of research. Uh, as you were, as you say, you were sort of poking at it and realized that there, there wasn't a lot of 
stuff out there um, that sort of trying to understand the bigger umbrella and then the groups within the umbrella. But I was also thinking about the fact that we've read about a thousand million stories in the New York Times and the Washington Post about white people at diners um, and what they think and and not so many (laughs) about people of color at a diner, say, um, and and, and what they think. And and so I was, you're you're trying to make up for some of that. I don't think you've made up for all of it, but... (laughs) Yeah, no. So that's that's a, you know in 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 the social sciences part of how you um, develop your career and your reputation is by usually not so much by coming up with something completely new, especially if you recognize that social science is sort of um, cumulative, but rather um, seeing dots that other people don't see and making connections between those dots. Right. Um, so in, in the case of, of, of people of color, you know, we talk a lot about, um, you know, increases in racial and ethnic diversity. And, and the particular frame, useful as it is, is that, you know, the increase in racial and ethnic diversity or quote unquote minorities has consequences for how white individuals or some white individuals actually um, see the world. Right. Um, and that's true. And that's an important perspective. Right. But essentially, um, we've we've emphasized it so much that it often comes at the expense of um, what these other uh, stakeholders in this polity um, might have, right? How they see the world. And the answer is not they view it the same. The answer is we should be impressed that actually these disparate groups with different trajectories, histories, ways of arriving to the U.S., treatment at the hands of U.S. authorities, that they sometimes find themselves psychologically on the same team. And that to me um, is perhaps what is is most impressive about a category like this, which um, stands alone, but basically is based on um, its ability to encompass all these other communities in a, in a meaningful way. And, and so I wanted to ask you uh, about the nuts and bolts of the research because you set up a study um, that looks at individuals who are in this umbrella um, with African Americans and Asian Americans and uh, Latino Americans, and um, and you ask them about the context in which they identify. Um, and I, I I thought that research was really interesting because you also said it's not in a vacuum. You have to understand how people identify um, in context uh, with their family with politics, um, with, and, and you're looking at students also. So, you know, with their major, apparently. <laughs> um, and so can you explain a little bit about how you started to design the context to get at this question of how people see themselves both within their particular group and then in this larger umbrella? Yeah. So, you know, the, 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 the honest answer is that, um, the moving parts and the argument that's developed in the book come from um, primarily from social psychology and from a very generic perspective. So the virtue is that that body of work, which fits under the umbrella of social identity theory, um, tells us that you know you can have uh, distinct outgroups, um, and that usually in settings where there are at least two different um, groups, um, there is a tendency from a, in, a, in a psychological sense to favor your own, right? Um, and and it's, it's a very natural um, um, tendency and it happens with a variety of groups, both meaningful and artificial. Uh, but what we also know from that body of work is that if you want to minimize conflict between them, one way is to shift their, uh, their vantage point from the immediate circle of peers to the types of um, experiences, attributes that you might share with others, right? And so this is a useful way to to bring this into into the study of racial and ethnic diversity because we have a category here that is people of color. And insofar as it operates as a common identity under circumstances, it means that you have to be able to shift the view of African-Americans, Latinos, Asian-Americans, and other not-whites from 
the immediate communities they belong to and value to sort of this larger team, right, that, that, that they are also uh, members of. So, you know, it's basically you adapting some of these very key psychological processes and principles to a new setting. Now, in terms of context, you know, one of the things that this work in psychology teaches us is that, you know, any group um, has particular boundaries. And within those boundaries, there is um, an average member and there is some dispersion around that average member. But you can always, there's going to be some ability to, to, to narrow or, or broaden that circle. And that really depends on the configuration of possible group members in an immediate context. So in the book, for example, um, when you ask uh, Black, Latino, and Asian individuals in, in, an, in an in-depth interview setting, um, you know, uh, essentially, you know, who is, who is, who qualifies as people of color and who is the best exemplar? All individuals in, in those interviews or most individuals in those interviews, both African-American and non-African-American will tell you black individuals are basically the best reflection. And it's usually a, a conversation about, well, you know, we all get the short end of the stick, but there is nothing like uh, being from a community that was uh, transplanted here forcefully and worked uh, and forced to work here, um, you know, for generations, right? And so that's sort of what comes up. But then in other studies that are more psychologically inspired, you can actually shift people's view about who owns the category people of color in a particular setting or context, right? And so we de I demonstrated this in the book with a, with a um, study that I conducted with UCLA undergraduates. So if you know anything about UCLA, it's an incredibly uh, racially and ethically diverse place, but it's also a place where African-Americans are numerically in smaller proportion to their Asian-American counterparts who are the plurality of the campus and then Latinos who are often described by university officials as a sort of ascending group, right? A group that's already chunky, but it's getting bigger. And so the manipulation in that study was essentially that, right? Like there is, but the control group was, there's a bunch of regional diversity because most um, in-state students come from Northern California, Southern California, et cetera. And then the treatment conditions were, um, Asian Americans um, are, are the largest segment of people of color, and then Latinos are a growing segment with it. And so the people in the two treatment conditions get asked some questions about how much, for example, af what, how, how good a reflection African Americans are of the category people of color. And the, the, the basically the, the signature pattern is those who, who respond to or were exposed to that treatment update their view about the prototype people of color, right? Essentially by, by downgrading um, African-Americans relative to some of the other groups. So, you know, it's, it's useful in two ways. In one way is that it's not set in stone. So the category of people of color is not set in stone, which means that there's an opportunity for political leaders to expand or narrow the boundaries of who we are. Um, and then the other one is that um, you know, it, because it's not fixed, um, it has both opportunities to, to really become stronger or in some cases um, fall apart, right? Where, where the category just cannot do the work that it needs to do. Because the big challenge is, you know, keeping together this coalition in a psychological sense of these different groups. And, and, the, and the main problem is that in order to do that, you have to remain, your, your group members have to be persuaded that uh, essentially the common struggle is important for everyone and that each group's struggle is not any, you know, shouldn't be receiving more priority than, than another. And that's problematic uh, in, in principally because one of the psychological principles that we see in human life is that we want to be special. We want to be unique. We want to belong with others, but we don't want everyone to belong, right? And so the way that that manifests itself in diverse settings is it can quickly unravel into 
well, you don't know what it's like to be the, the, the descendants of slaves. Well, you don't know what it's like to be to have undocumented parents and have to basically justify your existence here. Well, you don't know what it's like to have your ancestors interned, et cetera, et cetera. That's when this stuff falls apart, right? And it's a very real part of politics because if you see sort of misgivings about the, uh, the category itself, people of color in newspaper reports, a lot of the focus is often on, well, how meaningful is it if, if, if people can snipe at each other or have negative attitudes toward each other? You know, I always try to tell people it's the same way that I can have uh, in some circumstances, antipathy toward another Dodger fan. But when we're at the game watching the playoffs, we're on the same team, right? And so, th- th- it's, you know, it's a, it's a very silly example, but it's one that um, you observe in, in these uh, inner, inner group um, contexts and conflicts that, 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 you, that we see. And, and in terms of the research itself, you talk about the experiments that you did um, in using or surveying students and then also coming back and, and talking to them again um, after the initial survey. Can you explain a little bit about how you set up the research trajectory to get yeah. at um, what you are hoping to see or understand? Yeah. Yeah, so in, in some ways, the project started out as 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 a as a measurement project, right? Um, is this category people of color an actual identity? Um, so, can I get people to answer a battery of survey questions aimed to to capture um, identification with this category? And if they answer them, will I have you know? variation around their answers and then can that variation help to explain can it is it correlated with um, their support for policies that affect their own immediate group um, and 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 support policies that may not directly affect their group right Um, and can it do so independently of a lot of other things that we know affects the political views of African-American, Asian-American, Latino individuals. And so that's how those three parallel surveys sort of started out. And the simple, the the takeaway points were, um, we can measure this. Um, It is distinct from some other important identities that people of color hold. And it adds predictive value, right? It is associated um, with support levels for policies that um, range from support for Black Lives Matter, support for deferred action on childhood arrivals, et cetera, right? So then that's, that's, that, that was the initial, that was the, the sort of the main um, um, study that started it all. Well, you, if, if you know that you have a, a there there, then the question becomes, what is it? <laughs> you know, what's its nature? And so to answer that question, I conducted those in-depth interviews. And this was really a, a, a data collection for people to teach me what I couldn't learn. And I knew that I couldn't learn simply by picking up history books or Googling stuff, right? I mean, that's really the main takeaway. And it was a way to enhance the conceptualization of what people of color are. And that's actually where um, this uh, sort of conceptualization of people of color as a common identity that um, sort of accommodates these subgroup identities. That's where that's where that that sort of idea came from. That's where I realized, oh, this is this is just like what we see in, in social psychology. And so we have that, and then that's still not enough because then people are gonna want to know. Um, under what conditions might it matter? Um, are they really saying that they're people of color or like, are they just telling you what they want to hear? Um, and so on that latter point, I ran these experiments where uh, essentially individuals from the three major groups that I studied were giving vignettes, um, typically about a person from their own racial group or a person from another racial or ethnic group being um, essentially discriminated against by a, a white individual in the context of a, of a restaurant, right? It was sort of, and 
there are several experiments. The manipulations sort of change across some of these experiments, but the, the whole point is, um, do we basically observe uh, meaningless differences in the amount of how strongly these people identify as people of color, um, how positively they feel toward people of color, um, how predisposed are they to view themselves as a person of color, and the long and short is, um, you know, across all of these uh, experiments, um, we find essentially statistical debris. There is, there is, it doesn't matter which group you prime them with. Um, that experience of discrimination is enough to basically get them to be supportive, to, to bolster people of color. And it's not dependent on whether it's their own immediate um, group that's 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 at stake, if you will. Um, okay, so then that 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 gets you a sense that look, the category is real. Everyone's pitching in to some degree. Um, and then, okay, when when might it matter? When doesn't it matter? Right. That was sort of a way to to, to conclude the book. When might it go away? Um, or when does it fall apart? And the falling apart basically goes back to the very thing that the common identity um, essentially manages to balance, which is all of these unique experiences that these different groups have. And so in, a, in, in three parallel experiments with uh, participants from the three major groups that I studied, um, they get assigned to a control condition uh, and then, or they get assigned to a treatment. And the treatment is essentially, um, well, actually, there's two conditions. The control is um, all people of color are the same. They're growing. They're the same because they get the short end of the stick on a, on a variety of metrics. The treatment condition is essentially um, there's more people of color, but um, you can't compare African-Americans to these other groups. So that's if you are a black participant in these studies. If you're a Latino participant you get told that it's basically the experience of immigration and the experience of slavery and its effects are apples and oranges. And so just by simply, you know, reigniting those differences, um, the effect of uh, a person of color identity on support for these uh, policies um, essentially gets undercut substantially, right? So what it means is um, the effectiveness depends on being able to spin all of those plates in the air, right? We have different experiences, but keep your eye on the prize. The prize is um, there's systemic uh, oppression against all of us, or the way Martin Luther King would say, you know, basically oppression somewhere is oppression everywhere. That's sort of the spirit behind it. If you want to see it fall apart, um, if, if, you, if you've ever wondered why, um, some of these very same groups explay, uh, display sort of conflictual relations. Um, it has to do with um, this sort of apples and oranges comparison. And it's a really tough, tough, tough thing to, to win. You know, um, when, when the book was accepted, um, I got asked to write uh, an editorial, not an editorial, sort of a, an analysis for the Washington Post in the wake of the George Floyd protest. And one of the things that I clearly remember during that time was that as much as that case was getting a lot of airtime, and rightfully so, um, it was also the time when um, Vanessa Guillen's murder sort of was a story. And I remember uh, seeing on my Instagram accounts um, some primarily Mexican-American um, activists basically making the argument, well, why aren't we getting the attention? we're also getting murdered, et cetera. And I thought, man, if this stuff gets, uh, gets traction, this whole inter-minority, inter-minority solidarity thing is going to fall flat like soon. Um, and, and it didn't get as much traction because you would, it, 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 if, even if anecdotally you, you would see, you know, who's showing up to these protests, right? Um, it, you know, to the, to the credit of those organizers, it was a fairly broad cross section, um, of, of individuals. And I wanted to ask you specifically because you also ask a question with regard to Black Lives Matter um, in in the discussion in in the research. What did you find with regard to the outcomes when you asked that question about you know is this a valuable 
protest movement? Is this something that you're invested in, even to groups that were not black? Yes. Yeah, so the 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 takeaway finding, um, it, I mean, it's the, that, those kinds of items show up in two areas. They show up in in those three large surveys. And the main uh, finding there is, um, you know, holding constant differences in things like partisanship, demographics, racial identity, um, higher levels of a person of color identity. So identifying more strongly as a person of color, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, boosts uh, support for Black Lives Matter, not only among Black part Black uh, survey respondents, but among their Latino and their Asian American counterparts, and by pretty comparable degrees, right? So what's, what you're seeing in those correlational results is, is a suggestion that um, essentially, uh, to the extent that this is a salient category, um, it gets all folks who identify with it strongly to basically say, that's my issue, right? I should be supporting this as a person of color. Right. And in the experiments, they show up in the same way where if you harp on the commonalities between groups, you see that support for Black Lives Matter across all these um, different racial and ethnic groups. And then if you harp on the apples and oranges comparison, African-Americans remain steadfast, but the other groups basically tail off. Right. And so that that's sort of what you see. So, you know, in conversations about, um, you know, when you when you might hear or you see reports that, you know, a black issue is a Latino issue, a black issue is an Asian American issue, far beyond the soundbite, there's a reality there that can be tapped into. But a lot of it is essentially the psychological story that you get people, you, you, you tell people, right? What is the narrative here that, 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 that would make you or remind you that you also belong to a community whose basically beneficiaries are more than your immediate um, racial or ethnic community. And so this is an amazing book with great titles of all the chapters. Yeah. And so I want to recommend not only the title of the book, but all the chapters as well. Um, and you say in it, um, particularly in the acknowledgments, this is a book that you said you had to write, not to achieve tenure or promotion, but because you you needed to say what the book is talking about. Um, can you explain a little bit about why <laughs> this yep. was sure. essentially coming from you? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, some of it, as I mentioned at the very beginning, is, is, is you know, um, you end up seeing yourself as a data point, right? And you say, wow, there are, there are a lot of other data points like me out there. Um, you know, the other part is, is, you know, I, 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 I might not take myself seriously. I take my craft seriously. And, you know, um, much like my immigrant parents, um, work is a badge of honor. And so, you know, at the time that I arrived to UCLA, um, that was a, that was a very abrupt transition for me professionally. Uh, it was a change of setting, change, change in colleagues, um, change in expectations, um, and in some ways, um, writing the book um, gave me the kind of focus that I needed to to um, mitigate some of some of that turbulence. Right. It gives you focus. It gives you something to look forward to. And so I had to write it in a sense as a way to manage my own, you know, psychological, emotional well-being. Right. There is something powerful about um, consistency in, in, in work ethic. And I think one of them is that, you know, as a social psychologist or someone who is, is familiar with social psychological work, I can tell you that, you know, a, a big part of it is you feel you have some degree of, uh, of control in an otherwise uncertain sort of um, context. And that's why, the, well, that's more or less what the book played for me, the role it played for me for about you know, two years at UCLA. And even before that, it had already started at Vanderbilt. But again, it was, it was basically those three major surveys. And that was about it. Everything else was to come back and, and, and have something new, you know, professionally, you know, I've always, I always had a worry as, as someone that was on the tenure track that, you know, if I publish, um, you know, what they're expecting me to publish, um, how much of this is due to the particular setting that I'm in? I, I was in a very supportive uh, 
uh, environment at Vanderbilt University. Um, and will I, am I going to be a one trick pony, you know, essentially? And, you know, th that can be pretty, pretty, pretty nerve wracking uh, for, for people that are in a craft that is based on creativity. I mean, I know we don't look at it that way, but that's essentially what it is. Um, and so, again, uh, having that consistency and objective of trying to say something new that perhaps other people will find useful was enough to um, help me get through that through that transition period and to remind myself that you know in in this business it's mostly about about you know it, it's a, there there's a big expressive component to a lot of the work that we do i mean i i believe in the science uh i take my my identity as a social scientist very seriously uh, but there is there is sort of you know this almost artistic sort of side which is like this is the kind of work that I do because this is the kind of individual that I am, you know, and it's not better, not worse. It's just expressive. So may I ask you what you're working on now? Yeah. So, you know, a, lo a lot of my effort now uh, as a, as a full professor is essentially to develop a, a farm team of young talent. So most of the focus is often on um, graduate students and we have that focus in my lab, but um, I've been uh, slowly incorporating undergraduates uh, uh, at UCLA into, into the research enterprise with the goal of um, essentially getting them to work on publishable um, papers. So, you know, some of the stuff that we're working on, I think I mentioned um, there, is, there is one line of work that um, it, it builds on, on the book itself and tries to identify additional mechanisms that might spur um, more unity among people of color and then when we might find disunity. And so what we've landed on, and when I say we, I mean primarily a, a, a team of, of about four undergraduates, um, is this notion that, you know, um, solidarity is a kind of phenomenon that is very responsive to context. You don't go walking around feeling solidarity all the time. You feel solidarity under some circumstances. And so we have a set of papers uh, with different co-authors um, where we basically hypothesize that what matters for expressions of solidarity are, um, are messages that remind you that your group also shares a common form of discrimination. And so to give you a sense, you know, uh, we have a, a paper under review where um, we took a sample of Latino and a sample of Asian American adults. And what we know is that in America's hierarchy of groups, um, Asian Americans do not see themselves as, as being embraced as American. They're considered perpetual foreigners, but they are also seen as a quote unquote model minority. They're very well to do, right? Um, uh, Latinos in contrast are not considered well to do, and they, but they also are not considered fully American. So the idea is if we prime members of these groups with a message that says um, something along the lines of, um, you know, there are groups out there who, despite being here for a long time, are still considered un-American, and you read about this other group, that that's going to lead you to express more solidarity. And then that shift in solidarity should be associated with support for policies that implicate other groups. So in the two experiments, we find, for example, that um, relative to a control where people read about the extinction of uh, giant tortoises, if you are assigned to the treatment, the treatment, if you're Asian American, is, you know, um, Latinos have been here for a long time and are considered perpetual foreigners. I mean, in a nutshell, that's what it is. So no mention really of Asian Americans, just Latinos. That increases Asian American sense of solidarity with all people of color. And then that increase leads them to support immigration policies that are geared at uh, Mexicans, Central Americans, essentially not Asian Americans, right? Um, and then we do the same thing with, with Latinos. And for them, what ends up, it, incre it increases their support for high-skilled immigration policies, which primarily benefit um, uh, Asian uh, uh, Asian immigrants, right? 
Um, and so, you know, I can't, I can't, I guess I can describe visually what happens, but in the absence of that treatment, um, when you look at support for um, a more flexible policy toward undocumented immigrants, you see a, a significant gap in support with Asian Americans um, supporting it less, not surprising. Um, in the presence of that treatment, essentially the gap goes away. Right. So what ends up happening is, you know, they the Asian, Asian Americans and Latinos come to see themselves as part of a common team and it has an impact on 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 their politics. Um, in addition to that, I've been doing um, some work. There's there's a there's a, a book under review on um, the role that language plays in shaping um, mass opinion um, throughout the globe. Um, and it, it, you know, as part of that sort of, uh, of, of, uh, type of work, um, I have, um, some undergraduate and, and one graduate student who is, is working with me on extending some of that. So the extension here is how metaphors in different languages, um, essentially spur people to be more supportive or more opposed to certain policies simply because, the metaphors uh, resonate with the particular nuances of a given language, right? And so, um, you know, it, it, most most of my time, you know, the research is is sort of in, in that vein, um, but it's heavier on the mentorship side. You know, I'm a big fan of baseball, and one of the lessons I've learned from watching baseball all these years is I've always been impressed how professional teams have these um, farm teams, right, where they train uh, they recruit, they train, and they place, um, I mean, incredibly talented players um, who sometimes come from, um, you know, all corners of the world. You would never think that they would be amount to, to skilled baseball players. And so that's what we're trying to do in the lab. We're trying to do um, high-end research that other people uh, respect. But at the same time, you know, there's got to be another generation we can't play baseball all our lives, and so uh, we're trying to get the, some of these younger whippersnappers uh, on board to be more competitive when they when they apply to graduate school, uh, more competitive they apply to data analytics jobs. I mean, that's sort of the, the, the long and short of what's going on in, in, in my professional life these days. Well, I laud you. That is amazing. And it's so excellent that you are working with not only graduate students, obviously, but also undergraduates and developing them in this way. It's it's really great. Um, and should any of these come to fruition as books, I hope that you and your co-authors um, will come on the New Books Network and talk to me about those books when they come out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we will. All right. Thank you. Um, I've been joined today by Efren Perez, who's the author of Diversity's Child, People of Color and the Politics of Identity. This is published in 2021 by the University of Chicago Press. And I believe it's available at the University of Chicago Press website. Thank you so much for joining me today, Efren. Thank you.